Sure. Uh, Jack Swigert acknowledged our request for the stir. And okay. Stand by. Swigert then threw two switches. A light came on that said there was something wrong with your electrical system. But before we could digest that information, two more lights came on that said two out of three of your fuel cells had just died. It was now 55 hours, 55 minutes and four seconds from launch. My voice slips come live. Hey, flight, you've had a computer restart. Another one says antenna switch. Another one says main bus interval. And then down from the spacecraft level calls. Hey, we've had a problem here. Can I say again, please? Lights were coming on, noise all over, jets were firing. I had no idea what was going on. I looked up at Fred Hayes. I could tell from his expression he had no idea. RCS system, cryogenics, electrical power, AC power, DC power. I quickly looked at Jack Swikert. Uh, his eyes were as white as saucers. He didn't know what was occurring. We well, had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. I thought that uh, we've had another power glitch. We'd had two earlier in my shift. And we're going to solve this problem quickly and get back on track. Mission Control, of course, was being a couple hundred thousand miles away, was a little bit slower in realizing what was happening. They were chasing down a trail that said it was an instrumentation problem. The voice communications was solid. But a telemetry made absolutely no sense. But the real impact came when Jim Lovell was looking at Hatchman and says, Hey, Houston. Yeah, that's, that's what they see. And it looks to me, looking out the uh, hatch, that so we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. I could see a sea of debris around us of uh, little twinkly things uh, moving out away from the spacecraft, which I'm assuming is frozen oxygen. Now, Jack, is that right? Roger, we copy your venting. I was in mission control, and uh, Jim Lovell said we got a problem, and he was right. I thought we'd lost him when I saw that second oxygen tank leaking out. We were in serious, serious trouble. From then on, it was survival mode. Okay, now, let's everybody keep cool. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. What they do know is bad enough. Both oxygen tanks are losing pressure quickly. Two of three fuel cells are dead. Without oxygen, the remaining fuel cell won't last long. The uh, quantity indicator on the second oxygen tank was moving downward. Not very fast, but nevertheless uh, diminishing. And so it was apparent that we were going to lose that second uh, oxygen tank. The command module is dying. Its fuel cells need oxygen to produce electricity. And the crew needs oxygen to breathe. Their only hope is the lunar module. I realized we were shortly going to be out of oxygen, and they were going to have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat to get home. The lunar module has its own oxygen and power, but it's only equipped to support two people for two days. It's going to take four days to get three astronauts back to Earth. Every minute is critical. We figure we've got about 15 minutes worth of power left in the command module, so uh, we want you to start uh, getting over in the limb and getting some power on that. Following standard procedure, it should take lunar module pilot Fred Hayes two hours to activate the limb. I uh, drifted down. We had our activation checklist that we used. As I went through the checklist, draw a big X through whole sections and move on. Living in the LEM means they can't fire the powerful command module rockets to reverse course back to Earth. They'll need to make the longer trip around the moon. 
I made the decision that we would go around the moon as opposed to use a direct abort because I would have to jettison my lunar module. And I didn't want to lose my lunar module, which I considered a lifeboat. Mission control, we're looking, uh, now looking towards an alternate mission. Swinging around the moon and using the uh, lunar module power systems. That sounds like good news. Lovell fires the engine of the lunar module to set their course around the moon. Jack, about how long is it? The lightweight LEM offers little protection against the extreme conditions in deep space. To conserve power, only essential instruments are turned on. It was flimsy, uh, and it was not designed for long habitation between the moon and the Earth, which is pretty cold. The temperature kept dropping all the way down to zero Celsius, you know, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. It was uh, pretty... Uh bad environment to be sitting in for the number of days uh, that we had to uh, exist. 77 hours into the mission, Apollo 13 circles around the far side of the moon, using its gravity for a slingshot back to Earth. We're out of communication with the ground during that period. For 26 minutes, mission control hears nothing but static. There was a point, uh, call it a, sort of a second uh, point of disappointment on my part that we weren't going to get to go down there. The biggest question for mission control is whether the limited supplies in the LEM will keep the crew alive long enough to reach Earth. Everybody was making constant calculations. Do we have enough electrical power? Do we have enough water? Do we have enough oxygen? The answer is definitive. The crew won't survive. They have to get home faster. After uh, we passed behind the moon, we had to come up with a technique to uh, accelerate our return journey. We were going to have to use the engine of the lunar module a second time to speed up to get back. Otherwise, we'd be out of power. Ignition. Thrust looks good. Shut down. Hang in there, it won't be long. The extra boost cuts nine hours off the return journey. With careful rationing of water and power, their supplies should last. Should nothing else go wrong, uh, we had a shot at getting back to an entry. Conditions in the LEM are miserable. The low temperatures won't kill them. But every breath they take produces a poison that can. Carbon dioxide was beginning to build up in the lunar module atmosphere. The canisters to remove carbon dioxide in the lunar module, uh, there were only enough of them for two people. We were three. There are spare canisters in the command module, but a basic design error renders them useless. The command module carbon dioxide scrubber was square, but the lunar module was round. So we had to rig up a deal that was would work, this square deal in this round hole. The crew was faced with suffocation, so engineering came up with the idea to fabricate an adapter. They brought it in, we got down on our hands and knees, and they made me build it. And once I had built it, they said, okay, you know you know how to build it, now go tell Jack Swagger how to build it. We did it with uh, duct tape, with a piece of plastic, a piece of cardboard, and an old sock. And he plugged it in, and lo and behold, that CO2 level just came down so slick. It was great. As they approach Earth, the crew prepares for one of the most dangerous parts of their mission, re-entry. They need to get back in the command module and jettison the LEM that's kept them alive. 
We were concerned because this command module had not been powered up for days, and so it had gotten very cold inside.